Welcome to the last episode of White's story. Before leaving for Xinjiang, White gave his younger brother $6,000 of the $7,800 he robbed for safekeeping, claiming it was money he had recently earned and could be used for their mother's medical expenses. Later, White hid a rifle and ammunition in his coat and managed to sneak into the train station, which at the time checked luggage but not personal clothing. On May 13, 1997, White and Zi arrived in Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang, and immediately took a long-distance bus to Shaihezi, the area where White had served his sentence. His purpose in coming here was to stock up on ammunition, only to find upon arrival that the ammunition depot had been moved over a year ago. Xinjiang is China's largest province, accounting for 16% of the country's total area. It shares borders with eight countries, including Russia, Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan. It became the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in 1955, with the Uyghur ethnic group making up 73% of the population. The government launched a major development plan for the Western region, resulting in an influx of Han Chinese from other parts of China and the use of military forces for development work. To solve the marriage problems of male soldiers, many women were recruited from mainland to join the military, work, and settle in Xinjiang. This led to the formation of many military groups in Xinjiang. And as a result, the proportion of Han Chinese in the region continued to grow. In the 1990s, about one million migrant workers were recruited each year from mainland China to come to Xinjiang for the cotton harvest. White and Zi traveled several more hours to Shihezi and found White's former prison friend, Wu Ziming. Wu had been living with his parents after his release from prison. White told Wu that he had come to Xinjiang to do cotton business and needed some cotton money. Wu understood his meaning, and the next day he quit his job and joined White. He also moved out of his house and began living with White and Zi. Wu asked White how he managed to quit smoking and drinking. White explained that drinking clouds one's judgment, and smoking can leave incriminating evidence. He had seen real criminal cases where the perpetrators were caught because they left cigarette butts at the scene, so he had to be careful. After hearing this, Wu also quit smoking. For the next few days, White and Wu visited the cotton markets near Shihezi every day to gather information. Since it was the slow season for cotton trading, the merchants didn't have much cash on hand. After assessing the situation, White planned to wait for the right time to raid several markets in a row. He told Wu that they couldn't rush things and that they had to be absolutely sure before they acted, even if it took a few months. At this point, White also admitted to Wu that he had a rifle, but they needed another one before they could proceed. In May 1996, the two arrived at an armed police camp near Shihezi with plans to rob the guard again. Just as White was about to act, a soldier appeared and warned the guard to be on high alert because two prisoners had escaped from a nearby jail. This forced White to abandon his plan. In late May, while gathering information about the cotton markets in the nearby town of Kuitun, they noticed that the guard at a nearby military training center had the same Type 81 automatic rifles as White. On the evening of June 5th, White tried to sneak into the camp to steal a rifle, but was spotted by a soldier. They fled in panic, and the military assumed he was just a common thief and didn't report the incident. That night, as they walked through the Gobi Desert, they came across a police car. The police found the two men suspicious, stopped to question them, and insisted on searching their bags. While Wu was talking to the police, White pulled out his rifle and fired a shot into the air. The unarmed police immediately got into their car and drove away. When they returned, they reported to the police chief, and the next day, more than a dozen officers searched the Gobi Desert for hours, but couldn't find any bullet casings. There were no bullet marks on the police car, and none of the officers on duty were injured. Some people doubted the veracity of the officer's story, thinking that this policeman might have made it up to get credit. As a result, the matter was dropped. To avoid being chased by the military and police, White and Wu decided to flee on foot. They walked for more than 20 hours through Gobi Desert, 
then took a bus back to their residence. After that, they continued to scout the cotton markets, arsenals, and military camps. On July 5, 1997, after six scouting trips, White and Wu arrived at the 140 and 1st Division Armory, near the former prison where White had served time. At 6 p.m., White pried open the unguarded gate, entered, and shot and killed two large guard dogs. They found no weapons in the armory, only some old communications equipment, so they fled empty-handed. Early the next morning, at 4 a.m., the fleeing duo encountered a passerby on a nearby dune. To silence him, White shot the man. It was the first time Wu had seen White commit murder. The two then buried the innocent man in the Gobi Desert. After the police investigated the scene, they found that nothing was missing. They also discovered that the shell casings were of the 7581 model, indicating that a military-style firearm was used. Nearby farmers reported seeing two suspects, and based on footprints collected, estimated their heights to be approximately 1.75 meters and 1.7 meters. During a police meeting to analyze the suspect's motives, some officers suggested that it might not be a big deal, possibly just locals stealing dogs for food. Another officer asked why a gun was used, to which the answer was that many people in the area have guns, so it's not unusual. The meeting didn't reach a conclusion about the suspect's motives, but because of the use of firearms, it was considered a serious matter. At that moment, a police officer received a call reporting that a small motel had found bullets under a bed while cleaning a room. The police immediately went to the hotel and found a package of bullets in the luggage of a guest. The hotel staff mentioned that a man and a woman were in the room. Plainclothes police officers quickly disguised themselves inside and outside the motel and waited for the suspects to return. With the help of the hotel staff, several suspects were detained on the spot. After questioning, it was determined that they had come to the area to obtain firearms with the intention of robbing a bank and that they had no connection to White Case. He spends her days doing nothing at home, often chatting with neighbors. One day, while talking to her neighbor's daughter, she learned that the young woman worked as a Russian translator at the Border Hotel in Urumqi. She mentioned that business was booming there, with very wealthy merchants carrying millions of RMB in cash in sacks. The Border Hotel used to be a military facility, but since 1993 it has become the largest international trade market in Xinjiang, with more than 600 shops specializing in clothing, home appliances, and food. The main customers are from Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and other countries. Goods are shipped directly from Xinjiang's ports to these countries. In addition, foreign merchants bring products from their own countries to sell in this market, accepting large amounts of RMB, and then converting them into US dollars or other currencies to take back home. As a result, the Border Hotel sees many Chinese and foreign individuals carrying large amounts of cash into the market for trading or currency exchange, outside the market building on a daily basis. Shortly, White and Z stayed in Urumqi for two days and visited the Border Hotel. White noticed that there were indeed many people making large cash transactions there, much more than at the cotton market he had visited earlier. He decided to give up on the cotton market. The next important thing was to get another gun. Wu complained to White, can we ride motorcycles for the next robbery? Walking is too tiring. White replied, riding motorcycles makes us too conspicuous. If we ride, it should be somebody else's. On July 29, 1997, the two hid in the grass on the side of the road and prepared to rob passers-by. Wu stopped a motorcycle and pretended to hitch a ride but White suddenly appeared and shot the motorcyclist. They then buried the motorcyclist in the nearby grass. The motorcyclist was a local farmer. After searching for a while, they decided to target a police officer in a nearby suburb for their robbery. On the afternoon of August 7, 1997, they arrived near the police station on a stolen motorcycle and waited. In the early morning hours, White and Wu broke into the police officer's dormitory and fired shots, 
killing Officer Jiang and another guard instantly. White took Officer Jiang's Type 54 pistol and some ammunition before quickly fleeing on the motorcycle. The entire crime took less than a minute. After more than 10 hours, two police officers were found dead in the dormitory. They had been shot without warning, and the bullet casings found at the scene matched the bullets used to shoot dogs at the armory a month earlier. This prompted the police to conduct an extensive weapons search in and around Shaihezi. The killing of the two policemen and the theft of the pistol caused great anger among the local police and the people, and Officer Zhang's colleagues vowed to catch the killer. The Shihezi police soon learned that there had been several shootings in Beijing, using bullets with the same model number, 7581, but they were unable to reach the Beijing police by phone. Four days after killing the policemen, White and Wu pushed the stolen motorcycle into the river on the outskirts. Tai expressed a desire to return to her hometown to see her children and parents, but White refused. On August 14, 1997, White and Wu arrived at the border hotel in Urumqi to make preparations. White mapped out their entry and exit routes, then dug a pit in a nearby wood, and the two men returned to Shihezi later that day. The border hotel is located on Yan'an Road in Urumqi, right next to Xinjiang University. The university campus is quite large, with teaching buildings, dormitories, residential areas, farms, a lake, a hill, and an affiliated high school. The back gate of the high school leads to a grove behind Xinjiang University, not far from the border hotel. There's a gap in the wall between them that hasn't been repaired in many years making it convenient for locals to come and go, but posing an ongoing security risk. The pit white dug is in the grove behind the Xinjiang University affiliated high school. On the afternoon of August 18, 1997, White and Wu returned to Border Hotel and hid their guns in a pit they had dug earlier. They then checked into a small motel. The next morning, August 19, White, carrying a large bag containing a rifle, and Wu walked around the square in front of the border hotel, looking for potential targets. They soon spotted two Uyghurs in a corner, preparing to exchange a large amount of cash. White handed the pistol to Wu, took the rifle from the bag, and began to rob them of the money. When the Uyghur refused to comply, White immediately fired. He then threw a bag at Wu and went after the other Uyghur. The shooting caused chaos, and as they ran, White shot anyone who tried to stop him. Eventually, they arrived at the gate of the Xinjiang University affiliated high school. Some people chased them, but without weapons, they didn't dare get too close. The school was on summer vacation, but some boys were playing basketball on campus. They saw the suspicious people and heard someone yell from behind. Catch them, they are criminals. Unaware of the danger, some of the boys ran after them. White reached the back gate of the school and fired again, killing two 17-year-old students. Then they ran to the grove behind the wall and buried the weapons and money in the pit they had dug. They changed clothes and fled in another direction. The police had not yet arrived, and those without weapons did not dare to pursue them. The entire crime and escape lasted less than 20 minutes. They fired a total of 14 shots, killing seven people and injuring five others. The two bags contain a total of 1.4 million RMB and about 170,000 US dollars, both in RMB and US dollars. The shooting sent shockwaves through Urumqi and across the country. Police quickly cordoned off the area and soon identified the bullet casings at the scene as 7581. They then conducted a thorough search of the border hotel and the surrounding area. The military also took action blocking the city's main roads, and setting up more than a dozen checkpoints to inspect all vehicles in an effort to track down individuals carrying firearms and bags. Police sniffer dogs ran to the small grove behind the school, but got lost, then ran to another market and lost the scent. Police and military commanders watched and directed the operation from the hill at Xinjiang University, but they couldn't figure out how the perpetrators had escaped. Unknown to everyone, after escaping from the small grove behind the school, 
White and Wu walked out of another gate at Xinjiang University and made their way to an amusement park 1.5 kilometers away, where they rode the Ferris wheel. After leaving the amusement park, the two took a bus back to Shihezi. After the successful robbery, Wu was very excited and asked White several times a day when they were going to pick up the money, which annoyed White. White believed that Wu wanted half of the money, but he hadn't been very helpful. Wu hadn't even fired a single shot. In addition, Wu was careless, and having the money would draw attention to himself and risk being reported, which would put him in danger. Unable to resist Wu's nagging, three days later, on August 22nd, White and Wu returned to Urumqi, went to the small grove, confirmed that the money was still there, and White took out the pistol to carry with him. They returned the same day. The next day, White suggested to Wu that they couldn't spend the money in Xinjiang, so they should get the money out, and then return to Beijing to split it. Wu was both eager and a little worried. White said, We've been working hard for so long, it's time to relax a bit. Let's go to Tianqi in Urumqi first, and then go to Beijing. On August 26, 1997, White, Zi, and Wu went to the Tianqi scenic area. The three of them walked happily up the mountain. After walking for two hours and reaching a place where no one was around, they sat on the mountainside to rest. Suddenly, while Wu was drinking water, White took out a hammer hidden in his clothes and tried to hit Wu, but the injury was not serious. Wu got scared and ran down the mountain, and White, unable to catch up, quickly pulled out pistol and fired. After killing Wu, White poured gasoline on Wu's face and set it on fire. Zi, who witnessed White kill someone for the first time, was petrified. White promised Zi that he wouldn't harm her and urged her to quickly bury Wu's belongings and the tools used in the crime. The next day, White and Zi returned to Urumqi from Tianqi and retrieved the money from the small grove at Xinjiang University. They then hid $170,000 in vests. Wai left the rifle in Xinjiang and carried the pistol. They boarded a train back to Beijing that same day. On August 31, 1997, White and Zi returned to Beijing. On the same day, Wu's body was discovered. This time, White didn't hide the gun and money outside, but brought them back to their residence. White then went to his mother's house and gave her 10,000 RMB, about one or two hundred dollars, saying he had earned it in the cotton business in Xinjiang. His mother took the money, feeling a little uneasy, but didn't ask any questions. White took a shower, changed into clean clothes, and then went out with Z to spend some happy time. Z expressed her desire to return to her hometown to see her children, and White agreed. He gave Z 110,000 RMB, about $13,000, and told her to spend it as she wished, but not to deposit it in the bank. On September 2nd, White saw Z off at the airport. After she left, White felt deep regret for letting her go. He had thought about getting rid of Z and had tried to provoke her several times, but Z's compliant nature had prevented him from doing so. At the same time, police in Xinjiang linked the Urumqi and Shihezi cases by bullet numbers, identifying them as the work of the same perpetrator. They also found that the military in Beijing and Hebei province had lost firearms. When they compared the bullets from the Beijing case, they found a match, linking the Xinjiang, Beijing, and Hebei cases for further investigation. Based on eyewitness descriptions, the police drew two sketches of the suspects and asked the public for information. Police found a bag and other items left by White at the border hotel in Xinjiang. After an extensive search, they found the person who had sewn the bag and learned that one suspect had a Xinjiang accent, while the other had a Beijing accent. They also discovered that the bullet found in Wu's body in Tianqi matched the type of bullet found in the border hotel. But due to facial burns, Wu's identity could not be confirmed. During the investigation, police in Shihezi met with Wu's parents, who mentioned that their son had friends visited from Beijing a few months earlier but they did not know the man's identity. Xinjiang police repeatedly suspected that White was the person they were looking for,
by checking the Shahizi prison roster. However, White's height of 1.8 meters conflicted with the 1.75 meters, estimated by Beijing police through footprint analysis. In fact, it's because White's feet are relatively small for his height. On September 5, 1997, the Beijing police received a telegram from the Shihezi police in Xinjiang. At 7 p.m. that evening, White was at his mother's house watching television when there was a knock at the door. Because of the hot weather, White went to answer the door wearing only his shorts. When he opened the door, he saw four police officers standing outside. One of the officers, who had seen White before, said to him, Your ID is ready. Come with us to the police station to fill out some forms. White asked, Do I have to go now? The officer replied, Yes, right now. White understood the situation immediately. He said, Okay, let me get dressed. Just as he was about to get his gun, his mother came out of the bedroom to greet the police. White knew that if he used the gun, it would scare his mother and there would probably be more police outside. So he decided not to resist and told his mother, my ID is ready, I'll be back after I finish some paperwork. As soon as he stepped outside, the police arrested him. When White was first arrested, his immediate reaction was that Z had betrayed him. He didn't have a chance to worry about Z because she was also arrested in her hometown of Sichuan. He soon learned that it was Wu who had led to his quick arrest. Before going to Tianxi with White, Wu was afraid that White would silence him. So he wrote down White's and Xi's names and addresses and gave them to his brother. Wu told his brother that if he didn't hear from him for more than a month, he should take the note and report it to the police. Wu's brother didn't know anything about the robbery and didn't realize the seriousness of the situation until he was questioned by the police because he hadn't been able to reach Wu and was worried that something had happened. So he handed over the note that Wu had left. After White was brought in, Beijing police interrogated him throughout the night. After several hours of questioning, he began to confess to all the crimes he had committed. Police later found cash and a loaded pistol at his and his mother's home. They also found two rifles, buried in a brick kiln in Sushui, Hebei, and in a small grove at Xinjiang University. In addition, they discovered the bodies of Li and Fu, who were killed near the cow shed next to Shihezi prison, and the body of a motorcyclist in the roadside grass on the outskirts of Shihezi. However, the victim killed by White in the Gobi Desert has not yet been found. Upon returning to his hometown, Z spent over $3,000 in just four days before being arrested and taken to Beijing on September 9th. On December 3rd, 1997, White and Z were taken by police to Urumqi. Three months later, on the morning of March 3rd, 1998, their case was heard by the Urumqi Intermediate People's Court in Xinjiang. White was sentenced to death for premeditated murder, armed robbery, and theft of public and private property. C was sentenced to 12 years in prison. In his final statement, White expressed remorse and apologized to the people of Xinjiang. On April 29, 1998, White was executed by firing squad in Xinjiang, ending his life of crime. On April 26, 2005, after three reductions in her sentence and seven years in prison, the 48-year-old C was released. She told reporters, I hate him for not listening to me. White had a very strong ability to avoid detection. He was good at studying people's psychological states. He knew it was risky to rob in crowded areas, but if he fired a gun, people would scatter or hide, too afraid to look at him. He was good at timing and carefully planned his entry and exit times. After committing a crime, he would remove the gun and money from him, leaving no evidence on his person. In addition, he had very strong mental resilience and excellent shooting skills. If he had participated in a war, he might have been an excellent commander. White has not always been a bad man. He once wanted to provide a good life for his children, but faced with a harsh sentence, bullying, difficulty obtaining identification, 
and harassment from law enforcement when selling goods, he chose a path of extreme violence that hurt innocent people. He was undoubtedly a selfish, cold-blooded, and extremely vicious criminal. None of this can serve as an excuse for taking the lives of others. After the year 2000, gun control in China became stricter. Even buying imitation guns online could lead to a police investigation. White never imagined that in Xinjiang, where he once easily used guns to commit crimes, 20 years later, not only was gun control strict, but even the knives of meat and fruit vendors had to be chained and couldn't be taken away. The two students White killed at Xinjiang University affiliated high school were only two years older than his own children. They heard someone shout, catch the bad guy at the school and went after him. Perhaps they were thinking of the emphasis on bravery and righteousness in Chinese education. The person who shouted didn't dare to run after the criminal quickly, but let the students do it and didn't even warn them that the criminal was armed. What do you think of this case? Please leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments section. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my videos, please like and subscribe to my channel.